Hey, thanks all my friends for joining me today. My name is Troy Miller. I am your host tonight, and I'm also the organizer, the founder, the the person that's running F64 Live who's bringing you this tonight. This is uh, Joshua Sommerfeld, a good friend of mine who I met through mm -hmm. This Week in Photo and the TWIP Pro Network. Uh, we're both members there with our friend uh, Frederick Van Johnson, and there's a nice community there that we spend some time with. And I notice we've got some names in here. If I don't get everybody, uh, we've got Amy, we've got Peter, we've got Thomas Aaron. I'm sure there's a few others. So thank you guys for joining us. Today, uh, we're going to deviate from what would be traditional photography in the sense of, you know, we're not we're not using a sensor to capture photons. Joshua is not only a fantastic photographer, he spends a lot of time out in the swamp doing a lot of nature and macro, which is spectacular. But he does 3D art rendering that he tends to post quite a bit in the Twip Pro community. And it's amazing. It's really wonderful. And it's an art form that uh, seems very familiar to us that, that does portraits. So Joshua, without, without any further ado, um, I, I would like you to tell us a little bit about you. We'll kind of jump in and answer questions. Oh, before we do that, for those of you that are just joining us, I want to make sure that you're familiar with the controls of Zoom. At the bottom, we have a chat channel. You can turn on that tab. Uh, you're welcome to chat amongst yourself. We have a Q&A option down there at the bottom. In the Q&A, you'll notice there's three tabs. There's open, answered, and dismissed. Please try to put your questions in the Q&A tab under open. And that will help me and my assistant, David Schulman, who's standing on the sidelines and sending me notes to help us get to your questions. Uh, some of them we'll do during the program, some of them we'll do after. And then again, the chat is just for you guys. If you throw a question in the chat, it's very possible that we'll miss that. So, sorry, Joshua, go ahead. It, the floor is yours, my friend. All right, well, hello, everybody. Um, uh, like Troy said, my name is Joshua. Um, I go by um, low base guy on uh, on most online platforms uh, so uh, yeah I'm a photographer 3d artist uh, I got started um, in uh, this particular piece of software I'm going to talk about um, from uh, painting I used to uh, actually paint um, traditionally when I was younger and uh, later um, digitally um, and I got into um, Daz Studio um, as a way of making uh, simple posing and lighting references. Uh, uh, as I got more skilled with that, I started creating my own characters uh, and eventually uh, just left painting behind because I started to enjoy the 3D uh, modeling aspect of it. Uh, and as I... Uh, um, as I progressed uh, through learning more about Daz, uh, I noticed a lot of uh, similarities between um, it and photography, and, and I'll, I'll talk about that a little later, and uh, kind of fell in love with photography as a result. So I came into photography from 3D art. Um, so, so you used your, so three, so photography, how did you use photography with your 3D art? I mean, what was the, what was that sort of, connecting point for you well i'll show uh, i'll show a lot of that a little later on but as i as i um started learning more about the controls i saw uh controls within daz that were uh that had terms that might be familiar to most of you who are okay. I'm, sh I'm sure most people in here are photographers things like shutter speed f-stop iso these are all controls within the software um, that affect the render very much like adjusting those things on your camera would affect your exposure. Um, so yeah, I just, I, uh, that's how I got into it. Um, and I'll, uh, go ahead and pull up the website here and start sharing my screen. Yeah, go ahead and share the screen whenever, whenever you're ready to do that. So for those of you that are watching, um, we have an enormous amount of resources on the back end that Joshua has put together. Links, uh, assets. I put some links into his um, content that you can follow over there on the right. And I've also got some assets that he's provided that we'll make sure that you get those by the end of this conversation. And I'll also make sure that they're in the description in the YouTube channel. 
So we're going to, there's a lot of content and Josh and I have talked about like, this could be a three week long perpetual never stop (laughs) conversation, right? There's a lot of it. He spends a lot of hours on Twitch uh, streaming some of his content. So I I know Joshua, you can, you can mention how people can find you there. Mm -hmm. So we're going to, we're going to fill your head with a lot of information in a short amount of time, but just realize that it's all going to be made available to you at least by the end and in the, and the description on the YouTube channel. So this is the DAS website, uh, the homepage right here. Um, One of the uh, things you'll notice first is that this software is completely free. Um, Doesn't cost you a dime. Um, And, uh, when you download it, you will uh, download this piece of software um, right here called DAS Install Manager. Everything installed um, from the official DAS website, including DAS itself, is installed through this little box right here. And I'm going to... um, I'm going to actually show you that in a second, how to purchase something. But the first thing you will install is um, DAS itself. Um, yeah, this when you click that download link, this is the page you'll, you'll go to. You just put your information in to make an account, and you'll download it right there. Right. And it's cross-platform, so it doesn't matter if you're on Mac or PC. or It, it, it is available on both. Um, in fact, um, that actually leads very nicely into the next thing I was about to talk about, um, minimum system requirements. It uh, Whether you are running Windows or Mac, um, you need at least a dual-core processor, not uh, – you know, like a Core 2 Duo um, or something like that. Um, and Lots of RAM. A, uh, a minimum of two gigs. The website recommends three. Uh, I recommend a lot more. Um, you, you'll find uh, it'll be a little clunky if you don't have at least, uh, at least six to eight gigs. Um, that's just from my personal experience. Um, you will also need an OpenGL compatible graphics card. Um, so pretty much any of the modern the modern hardware within probably the last what three years should I mean should be able to you, handle that. If you can run Lightroom or Capture One, you can probably run DAS. Okay. But um, one thing that I want to make a special note of, however, um, DAS comes with two render engines. Um, out of the box, um, 3 Delight and uh, NVIDIA iRay. Um, uh, a render engine is just the method by which um, the software interprets the data and produces an image. Mm. Uh, if you are, uh, for this demonstration, I will be using iRay, uh, but iRay does require you to have an NVIDIA card. Uh, once upon a time, NVIDIA allowed um, users with uh, a discrete AMD card um, to make use of it, but they've decided they no longer wish to do that. So if you want to make use of iRay, you have to have a uh, discrete NVIDIA card. Got it. Got it. So it requires it requires some horsepower. So Just, uh, A little bit, but it's not as much as you would think. Um, 3 Delight is a, um, a very lightweight uh, render engine, and you can uh, you can run it on pretty modest hardware. That's good. Uh, yeah, I could I can I could see this getting to be an expensive hobby for someone where they're going to be like, oh, I need bigger hard drives, I need faster CPUs, and custom <laughs> custom built machines, and. <laughs> Well, welcome to my world. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because I do because I do this and photography. <laughs> um, so this uh, what I'm looking at right now. This is the actual shop um, through which you can buy um, pre-made assets. Um, you can see uh, you can get everything from characters, clothing, um, morphs, which I'll explain later, um, poses, lighting. Every everything you need uh, to make a your own scene, 
and, and that's one of the, besides the fact that it's free, this is the other thing that I really love about Daz is it doesn't matter what your skill level is. You can jump in, start making use of pre-made assets and um, reverse engineer, learn to make your own and uh, wean yourself off of that or continue to use pre-made assets either, either way. Um, so, so everything that you could purchase in there, could you build from scratch if you wanted to? Me? No. Well, I mean, but, uh, but, but somebody <laughs> could, right? I mean, like essentially. Sure, sure. Okay. okay. So, so My, you, can, uh, you could dive deep into that if you really wanted to. If you are, if you are uh, capable of completely creating your own content, you, you don't need to buy a thing. And there are also, um, third party sites, um, which um, I can link in the chat here uh, that you can, uh, you don't have to buy um, from the official site. And I'll show, um, I'll kind of, for, for the purposes of this demonstration, I'll be working mostly with official DAS content, but I will show how to, uh, how to deal with third party stuff a bit. Um, so say, uh, Let's purchase something here. Why not? I've picked out this cute little outfit here that we're going to use later. And um, I do want to note um, Daz has a uh, kind of a loyalty program called Platinum Club, which um, it costs 70 bucks a year. It's completely optional, but they do give you a lot of discounts, a lot of good coupons. And I'm going to kind of also show the benefits of that. So I've added this outfit here this uh, little garden outfit to my cart. And uh, you can see how much of a discount I'm already getting on it. That's because A, it was already on sale and I get an additional discount for being a Platinum Club member. One of the other benefits of Platinum Club is they give you monthly coupons, which you can find here in your account. So I'm just going to take this one and right. copy it. So it, it, I, I'm going to assume that the platform with Daz is it's a free platform because they have all this option to buy in content yep. in the back end. So, I mean, it's good yep. as a consumer to understand where the company's coming from and how they're getting paid, right? So they provide Absolutely. all this content and assets on the side. Okay. But you, yep. can, you can still do all the rendering and you get the software and you can get to start the and addiction right away. For free. Exactly. <laughs> and they give you, um, from the get go, they give you a nice little starter pack, oh, um, good. Okay. including, good. including a very nice tutorial on how to, uh, um, kind of where everything is, how to set things up. So, so they're, they're pretty good about setting you up, you know, um, but I'm going to copy this coupon here and go to my cart. You can see it's already in my cart. It's already got a nice bunch of discounts on it, but I'm going to throw this coupon in there and pay a grand total of 28 cents for this outfit. <laughs> so, so you're a heavy user. <laughs> um, yeah. That's okay. That's good. That's because I don't know. I don't know how to make my own clothing. I I make my own figures, and that's about it. Ah, uh, okay. Yeah, because uh, Cheryl, Cheryl in the chat says she she makes her own models and it's very addicting. So that's kind of what you're doing. You're making your own models, but the clothing right. you're not making. Got it. My own models and most of my own uh, textures. Nice. All right, so we'll place. Really? Okay. I thought, <laughs> I thought, that, was, thought that was saved. Oh, that's okay. Well, this is real world, right? Like this is how yeah. this stuff happens. Bear with me just a second. I'm gonna. <laughs> that's fine. That's fine. Stop so... the screen. Stop the screen share while I enter my PayPal information in. Oh, yeah, you don't need to send that to us. So, the for those of you who have have jumped in, I know we've got quite a few people that have jumped in since we started. Um, in the at the bottom, you've got your chat channel, so you guys feel free to use that chat panel to talk amongst yourselves. Uh, you can make fun of Joshua, but not me. That's just how this works because I'm the host, he's the guest. Um, and there's a Q&A panel in there too where you can throw in questions and then we'll keep track of those. I got my buddy David Schulman on the sidelines fielding all those questions and we'll get to those later. So so just, uh, uh, right. you got it? Oh, look at him go. I got it. He's faster so, uh, than I thought. <laughs> yeah, so made my purchase. 
we are done with that. So now I've already got DAS install manager open. Now, when you open it, it will load anything that you've purchased or had, that has yet to be downloaded. But because yeah. I already, because I already have it open, it hasn't done that yet, but that's easy enough to rectify. We just hit this little refresh button up here. And we should see it appear. So now this is this is just the process for downloading the assets after you've already installed DAS. Correct. Okay. Do you know this what is DAS also stands for? is that an acronym? Not a clue. <laughs> okay. But it's funny you mentioned that because this is also the process for installing DAS itself. Oh, okay. Good to know. Um. So we can see my asset that I've purchased has just popped up. We're going to check it and hit inst or start queue yeah. and it'll download and install it. Now, how powerful a machine do you have on like a, you know, a scale of one to 10 for machines? I know you use Alienware and I know it's, mm -hmm. it's, you know, that's a PC and um, windows based and I know it's a laptop, right? If I'm correct. Yes. Yeah. So it, you know, how fast, I mean, how fast is it? Is it, is it, is it wicked fast or is it, do you, do you need faster? Or is it as fast as you can buy? I, I, it's, it's probably as fast as I can afford, but, um, it's on a scale of one to 10, I'd say it's a six or seven. Um, you know, it's, it's a, it's, it's a pretty powerful laptop, but it's still a laptop. Right. It's a gaming machine basically. Right. So it's a right. high end video card, fast Ram SSD main drive is an SSD, those kind of things. Okay. Right. And so it went, it downloaded from here, went to install. And then this is everything that's installed. Um, now here she is Daz itself. I've already loaded a, a figure. Um, but I'll talk about that momentarily. So anything purchased through Daz, uh, through the official Daz site will show up here on your smart content tab. And the cool thing about it is it's contextual. Um, in fact, you can turn that on and off if you want to, this part that says filter by context. So when this is checked and I have a figure selected, only content that applies to that figure will I be able to see. Um, we will come back to that thing I just purchased um, here shortly, and I'll show you how to load it. It'll be on a different figure. But um, let me deselect this figure so you can see everything. Now, um, again, this is only officially official DAS content. Now, third-party content um, will usually give you a direct download, uh, much like uh, the, uh, I believe most, if not all of you should have the little um, pack of poses I made um, just for this webinar. Um, but I will go ahead and sh show you guys how to install that real quick on Windows. So I, well, I had it sitting here. There it is. Um, it's very important when you get three um, third party content to read the instructions because uh, you will not be able to access this content via smart content. So you have to use um, a file browser, which I will show you. Um, but every, the reason I say pay attention is every asset maker, every content maker, packages their stuff differently. And so uh, it, it can often be in a very nonsensical order. I try to make it easy. Um, all you should have to do is extract the zip file. And I'll go ahead and extract it right here on my desktop. And um, DAS content in the file browser is typically organized by type of figure that it's for and then it, get, it it starts broad and gets more specific. So it starts here with people. And you want to put this in your, um, in your um, library folder. So 
that's smart content. Here's your content library tab. This is your file browser. Anything that is installed via the official DAS site and visible in smart content will show up in these two tabs here, DAS content. In the top left, okay. Uh, and all of, uh, yes, by default, it's in the top left. So maybe um, I'm getting ahead of you, but you've opened up DAS and you're already showing us a model. Are you gonna show us how to do this from a blank slate? So that yes. if I've never, okay, okay. Um, yes, uh, the reason I already have a figure loaded um, is because uh, when you load a figure by default, they are not clothed. And for the purposes of, of yeah. the, I, I imagine you would prefer to keep this webinar safe for work. <laughs> yeah. So, so that's, that's why I've already loaded a figure. But yes, I'll show you all how to actually load a, a okay, base figure good. from nothing. Yeah, thanks um, for considering that. That's a good thought. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, anything that is third party or not, uh, not from the official uh, DAS market will go in to a folder that by default is called my library. Um, I don't actually, I've, I've moved mine, so it's in a different place, but, uh, and that's, and I've titled it differently, it's just library, but by default, it will say my library, and to find where it is, all you have to do, let me close this out, is right click wherever you've put your uh, content library, just right click it, browse to folder location, and it will pop right up. Okay, cool. And for, uh, to make it easy, I fix mine so that it's already in the proper format. You don't have to do anything to it, make any special folders. All you have to do is copy it, which requires pressing the correct buttons, <laughs> copy it. Nothing and, works when you're doing a live demo, by the way, as you uh, know, because no, you do a lot of Twitch no. feeds, like that's when everything crashes and the internet goes down and yeah and that's it you just paste it right in there now when you when you download third-party content i strongly suggest making a note of the file path now you'll get used to um you'll see common um uh types of content follow the same type of file path and you'll get used to it um, but especially when you get started i strongly suggest writing the file path down be because as I mentioned earlier, this is not going to show up in smart content, so you actually have to browse to it. Um, what I typically do, let me pull my iPad up and I can show it to you. I actually have a spreadsheet. Well, you can't really see that. <laughs> but yeah. I, I have a spreadsheet where like when I download clothing, hair, whatever, I'll put like what character I'm going to use it for, what it's called, and then write out the file path so I can find it later. Oh, my gosh. Um, and like, like I said, every content maker has a different idea of where to put that stuff. And you can look in my library here, and it's a mess. It's a lot so, of content. Way, I'm just, I'm thinking like, I, I was complaining not that long ago about how much content I have to deal with, like my photos. <laughs> and that's nothing compared it's, to... It's a lot. But so before you file it away, I'd suggest looking. So like here, you could open it up and you can see it says people, Genesis 8, poses. So make or, make an effort to have an organized system ahead of time as opposed right. to just dumping stuff into a random folder because you're going to be really unhappy later because those assets, because mm. it seems like Daz is very heavy on external assets. Um, yes. that you have to load and manage and know where they are. So, okay. Organization is key, I have, my, my friends. I have assets I've never used because before I implemented this system, I would file stuff and then never be able to locate. <laughs> but so like, now I, I happen to know where it is, but you, you would want to open this up and look and you'd see people, Genesis 8 female poses, low base art, low base is freebie poses. And you would find that by coming into your library. Now, if you have a large library as I do, you'll get what you're noticing now. It takes t it can take a second to populate within the content library. So sometimes you'll get this lag 
while it adds up the folders. Right. And to be and to be fair, not only are you streaming, but you're running a 3D rendering program at the same time that's pretty damn heavy. So in like two dozen tabs on Chrome. <laughs> so but if you can gen generally remember, start vague and get specific. So we're looking for something right. that's for a person, people. And again, there's a lot of stuff in there. So it's going to take a second to pop. Well, that didn't take as long as I thought. Can you render things other than people? Absolutely. Oh, okay. Animal, right. Animals, furniture. Okay. Okay. I, I only ask because you pose people and I've never seen other than people. So that's uh that's because i am a character artist uh i'm not the 90 percent no i'd say 99 percent of the environments you see in my renders are not my own creations they're they're um, assets that i've purchased or traded got it, got it. um and it would be genesis 8 female Poses. Okay, the folders are alphabetized and poses starts with a P. There we go. <laughs> nice. It's that whole organization. That's why we had to learn the alphabet in elementary well, school, right? <laughs> well, it amazes me how I can still have trouble locating folders that are alphabetized. <laughs> and again, this is just the popul it's populating. So do all of the all of the poses come in sort of in a neutral stance, kind of like this, where you have to manipulate from there? The figures, uh, the by figures, default, yeah. will start this way. Um, Got it. In a in a in a T pose. A T pose. Ooh, that'd be good. I could tell my I could tell my uh, my bride that. Okay, give me the T pose, and I'll go from there. <laughs> There's a, a technical name for it, but to be honest, I don't remember where it is. What it's called, I mean. Uh, there's my, there's my folder, low base. There's my, uh, poses that I've made and you can see low bases, freebie poses. And here they are. And now these poses are for, um, Genesis eight, which is the newest base DAS figure. Um, what you are looking at on the screen here is Genesis two. Um, so these poses will not work on her. So I can't, um, really demonstrate them right now, but um, I will show posing here uh, when I get into uh, you know working with the figure. But that's where they are. But that's how you find anything, be it poses, clothing, figures. Like you can see. Um, let me close the pose folder. That's quite a list. I'm watching you scroll, and I'm like, that is that is a monster list. It's it's a lot. Um, but there, you know, your characters, figures, pieces of anatomy, hair, clothing, it's all in there. Okay. Um, it is obviously much more convenient working with official as content. However, it is also much more expensive. Um, so before I continue, oh, did I close that tab? No, I didn't. Um, I'm going to drop this uh, in the chat here. This is just a little list I've compiled of um, at sites where you can get assets. Yeah, we can throw that in there for you. Oh, okay. If you if you got it, that's that's great. Yeah. Um, but uh, the for those of you that don't have it, the link to the uh, the the little pose this little pose pack will be in there. Um, just and just a few sites that um, you know I find reputable and um, will give you good deals on things. Now, small heads up: a lot of these third-party sites um, contain copyrighted figures. Like you can buy, um, like on Forender, for example, which is one of the sites I listed. Um, you can buy like Darth Vader, uh, things like that. Just um, be careful using that stuff and how you use it in your artwork because um, you don't want Disney coming after you. And Disney does do that. Yep, yes, they that. do. Yeah. 
yeah. I, 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 I chose that one specific, specifically for a reason. Yeah. yeah. They, they yeah. will, uh, they will come after you. Um, but it's good. It's good for all of us as content creators to respect other creators content. I mean, it's just always a good thing. Yeah, absolutely. But you know, if you're, you're, you're doing fan art, you're not selling it. It's not, not generally that big a deal. Um, which is why I included the site. Right. Um, so let's see, I already talked about the, uh, render engine so we can look, we're ready to kind of look at Daz itself. Um, so, um, Joshua, how long, how long does it take to get comfortable with it? You know, maybe not as an expert, but you know, where you feel like, you know, where things are, you know, how to load content. I mean, is this a 10, 12 hour kind of thing or a 10,000 hour kind of thing? Well, I've been using it for about seven years and I'm still learning aspects of it. Like, um, for example, uh, I, I've just started exploring the 3d printing, um, exporting models for 3d printing, which I know almost nothing about. Uh, this software is also capable of animation. You can actually animate these figures um, create whole videos and everything. I know nothing about that. <laughs> nothing, nothing, not a blessed wow. thing. I got my little animation tabs down here. Don't know what in the world to do with them. Um, I've only ever done still images. So, um, but I think by about the uh, two or three year mark, I was um, reasonably, uh, reasonably uh, comfortable with it. Um, as my purposes for this software changed, I kind of learned it little by little because in the beginning I was just using it for simple posing and lighting references. So I would load a base figure, maybe put up a light and then paint the actual character that I wanted to paint. Um, right. and you know, then I learned to make characters. Then I learned to, uh, you know, uh, make my own textures and things and weaned myself off of uh, the Daz market for the most part. Got it. So it, it takes, it takes a while, but um, you can, with these, with the assets that you purchase, get started relatively quickly. Um, once you, once you, uh, can, it's, it's a little bit like Photoshop. I know a lot of us remember the first time we opened Photoshop and went, Oh my, <laughs> and went, Oh my God, that's a lot of crap. Once you get over that aspect of it, it's, it's, uh, it's not super difficult. And this workspace is completely customizable, uh, much in the way that capture one is. Oh, uh, for for those of you that are familiar with Capture One, all of these tabs, you can move around. You can put in their own windows, um, so you can make it work for you. And uh, even if Daz doesn't do something that you want it to do natively, odds are somebody's made a plugin that will make it do that thing. Oh, that was gonna be my next thing. Is there a big support community around Daz to help you get? you know, tutorials and content and, and forums and things like that. So it seems like it's probably pretty popular. There, there are many, many support communities, YouTube videos. Um, there's, okay. there's tons of stuff out there. Um, if you want to know anything, um, um, obviously, you know, I'm here as a resource. You, know, you put my links in the chat. Um, I am happy to answer any questions that I can, but also um, Google it, YouTube it. Trust me, it's out there. Um, and Daz itself has uh, pretty great forums on its own site. Oh, good. Um, okay. That's where, always where... good. You know, it's always good when we get into software, we get into content that we want to play with, and there's a support community out there, right? As opposed to something like totally obscure, under a rock, nobody knows anything about it. Right. <laughs> well, that's this software is 15 years old. Oh, okay. Cool. It's It's been around a while. And um, the, the creators of this um, have also owned, um, either created or owned software that many people are familiar with, things like um, Bryce for landscapes. Oh, somebody, okay. mentioned, somebody mentioned Poser earlier. Um, Daz at one time owned Poser. Um, they've since sold it. But, um, you know, so it's, it is well supported. Got it. 
Um, but we'll uh, just look. Uh, we'll just run through these menus real quick. Yeah, um, let's jump in. While you're doing that, I'm going to throw some questions at you. But go ahead and keep going okay. through the menu. Um, Frederick is asking uh, two questions. Is is uh, can you export this? You know, your models to use in other software like Fortnite. But you know, uh, I, I have never touched Fortnite, so I don't know what's required to import a model into that. Got it. But um, I was getting into that here in a minute. But yes, you can export your models into most accepted um, 3D formats. So if you okay. were going to export this into, um, say, Blender or... Um, um, uh, Cinema 4D, Maya, um, any of those, there you can you can do that. Um, in fact, there are in some cases specialized plugins, um, which I'll, I'll show uh, I'll show here in a second as I go through the menu. Like uh, for ZBrush, for example. So, say you're skilled at sculpting, you want to make your own morphs. Um, oop, I did not mean to click that. Uh, but you can export into um, ZBrush directly um, rather than having to export the file. Um, you can, there is a plugin for Maya. If you're a Maya user, you can export directly into Maya um, rather than having to export the file as a, a say an OBJ or whatever format. Um, so it has a lot of support, which is nice. Okay. Good um, there is also, which if we have time, I'll show how to do it. Um, you can also render uh, directly to a Photoshop layer. Oh my! Um, if you, I'm looking if, forward to seeing how you make a thing. If you so, if you so choose, but yeah. So you know, um, most see these are those plugins I was talking about right here. So if uh, for specific pieces of software, um, this is for the th uh, Photoshop 3D bridge. One. Uh, so I want to talk for a second about the save menus. Um, one thing is really, really important, uh, to remember, uh, most of us, you know, we work in Photoshop, we work in some kind of editing software, creative software, and we know save often, save often, save often. But a lot of times if you're working with Photoshop and say Photoshop crashes, you can get like an auto save, like it'll recover at least some of what you did. Um, Daz doesn't do that. Daz has no autosave at all whatsoever. Um, so the only time it will save is when you save it. I hear, I hear, I hear in your voice that you've experienced the. <laughs> it hurts too. It hurts to be like 30 edits in and lose what you did. Yeah. Cause I'll get into that flow and completely forget to save and then boom something happens and i lose it all i've oh, been no. there many many times but uh control s saves saves the entire scene as it presently is but you also have the ability to save as different scene subsets so say you just want to save a character for future use and for for use in other scenes you would save as a character preset or you want to save a pose much in the way that I did when I made those poses for this webinar, oh, wow. you would save as a pose preset um, or you, you made skin. You want to save that skin material presets. So it's um, you can save individual pieces of it. And then this is um, this goes in this important export um, goes to what Frederick was asking about. Um, not only can you export, and uh, I have it as an OBJ by default, but you can see you can export it as a poser file. Um, that's if you, I believe you were rendering something with Mental Ray. Some, one of these is for Cinema 4D. But yeah, you can you can export in most major majorly accepted 3d formats that's cool um you can also um by the other side of that coin import most major 
3D formats, even ones that are not um, natively DAS. So you can import, say, an OBJ file, which is it's the most common um, 3D file format. Uh, so let's see. Um, so edit there's a lot just... of cross-platform usability, right? Because even Photoshop yeah. does has a whole 3D option. Not not this sophisticated, but you could you could actually you know use one file from the other. Um, you can. Um, in fact, fo um, Photoshop 3D accepts OBJs, so oh, you nice. could you could export this as an OBJ and then import it into Photoshop if you wanted to. But um, you edit menu, just little um, editing things, um, things for uh, to. Uh, deal with poses, um, reset stuff, um, duplicate. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to get into every little piece of it, but um, I'm always happy to answer questions. Um, yeah, well, it's important to know off. where all the pedals and switches are, you know, it's <laughs> um, before you start so, driving. And a lot of the stuff in this top menu is duplicated here in these tool tabs, um, these little tool buttons. So I'm not going to... Uh, I usually use these more than I do the menu, but you, uh, these would be your uh, creating pieces. So say you were building something in this software, that's where all this for your lights, your basic pr um, primitive shapes. Um, that's what all of this is for. Um, these are your tools, which are also duplicated right here. Um, these are your render settings, which I have... Um, set i have in a tool tab over over here um let me get this thing out of the way um this is the stuff that links to your account um so uh, stuff that you um purchase via the uh, uh official DAS site uh needs to be verified or you won't be able to use it and that's what all this is for. So you'll need to um, log into your account the first time you uh, you run the software. Uh, let's see, this is for setting up your workspaces. So I mentioned earlier, this is kind of customizable. So you can um, say you only want one camera. Um, you know, you can have it any way you want it. My my particular workflow is uh, have a main workflow and then three cameras on the side because I might um, you know I might have the main camera looking at one side but then I'll want to look at another side or I might want to look at the main scene while I'm posing the model's hand you know right. that kind of that kind of thing so that's that's we have to think that in 3d right i mean you know it's it's there's there's more sides to this so it's good to be able to see around so so the setup can really help your workflow okay definitely um now the scripts tab is for anything um that you've created a custom shortcut so when i i've set up a couple of cameras for so speaking of which i've set up say a couple of cameras for when i work with a model so you can do from front, back, right, left, and those sit there. Um, this is hurting my head already. Yeah. And then I've <laughs> um, I've also loaded you know some custom cameras, some of my portrait backdrops, um, things like that. And then of course help if you need it. Now almost everything in this is duplicated here. This is your create a new scene. This is opening a file. Now, this is a distinction here that I didn't make when we looked at um, when we looked at this. Now, if you open this, this will open a file as a new file, a new scene. So if I were to so if I were to open this, it's going to ask me if I want to save because um, it's going to close this scene out and then open a new one. Got it. You also you also have the option to merge. Which means, so now these are all my um, characters here. This is where they live. So I could merge one of my characters in with this character. And you can also do that. So say you were uh, doing this. Now, this isn't going to open a new scene, but say... Uh, 
you have the op option to open everything. So say I wanted to open this environment in a new scene. I could do that, and it would close this scene out. Right. Or I could merge it into the scene. So if you wanted to, if you wanted to put into the your model scene. into that scene, that's why you would merge them to create the background or the room. Or, or, or put the room into where my model is. Right. Correct. Oh, wow. I like just finding the scene. You know, I'm, I'm kind of like, <laughs> I like to walk out and go, oh, look, it's beautiful sunlight. Click. You have to build that. You have to decide where to put the sunlight, where to put the room, and then... Um bend them up which which you're going to show us a little bit of i know sure uh, and there are there are defaults but those defaults get boring really quick if you right. want like for the first couple uh well, we'll just say embarrassingly long time most of my renders had all the light coming from the same direction because i didn't know <laughs> <laughs> but um all right so we're ready to start a scene we want to load a figure so pretend that's not there you would come over to – let me make sure that's not selected. You would come over to your Figures tab, or it's, maybe you want to start with an environment. You can do that as well. You can start – load an environment first. Personally, I usually start with a figure because um, it's less memory intensive to do that. And um, you can see I have all kind of pre-bought characters here. Um, I also have animals, dragons – whatever the heck that thing is um <laughs> can you so, get can you get like hollywood models or you know as avatars or you know via third-party sites yes okay um daz itself has a very strict copyright filter um but um for render is a good one for that and i um that's on that asset site list got it okay so um, pretty much if you if you can think of it you're probably going to be able to find it most definitely whether or not you should share it with the public is kind of the, the different scenario right because sure. copyright laws yeah yeah um you know just ju just remember you know, use your head don't don't be selling a picture of a copyrighted right, uh, right character you know don't um you know fan art that's usually fine i do a lot of fan art um but yeah, you use your head. Don't don't be infringing on anyone's copyright. You know, we're all I think most of us here are content creators. Right. Right. And and you know, we don't like when people steal our stuff. So, you know, don't do it to somebody else. Right. Um, but your basic figures, um uh Daz uses the Genesis uh figure system. Um and all of that is here. Um, Genesis is somewhere, probably being different, not in where I thought it was. But <clears throat> what I've loaded is Genesis 2. So in order to do that, I find Genesis 2 base female, double-click that, and the figure loads as you see it minus the clothing. Um, and once I have done that, uh, I would imagine – uh, oh, I do want to note the higher end, the figure. So Genesis 8 is the newest. Um, the longer the figure will take to load. And there is a glitch in Daz that if you have – with Genesis 8, that if you have content installed on multiple hard drives as I do, um, Genesis 8 takes a long time to load, which is why I'm not working with Genesis 8 for this webinar. Um, so that's something to be aware of. But if you have everything installed on one hard drive, it's not a big deal. Um, but I've loaded Genesis 2 here, and it would be pretty boring just to render that. So maybe we want to create a character here. What do you say? Yes, So Let's do that. Um, a, that is done by what's called morphing. So one thing I want to do, I want to select, or the first thing I want to do is select my figure here. Now, you can install, now you notice the menu changes as I select a figure because I have that filter by context on. So it's only going to show things that can be applied to this figure. Now, one thing I could do is apply just one click 
apply a pre-made character. Now it's actually going now some of these will actually give you the option. Do you want to load this as a new figure or apply it to an existing character? Well, I want to apply it to the existing figure. So that so that is this like a pose that you're loading? This is a morph, which is a way of saying sculpting. Okay. So everything about this figure is about to change. So, so we're, you know, hand position, leg position, body position, uh, the, the, you know, the, um, everything about her features, rather the pose is going to stay the same. Okay. Um, this is just, um, uh, the, the character itself, like, um, oh, okay. Got it. Skin textures, things like that. Sometimes, okay. sometimes. Um, sometimes pre-made assets like this will include a skin texture, but you oh, can okay. see it just changed her shape, her face, everything. So that is this character. Oh, okay. Um, personally, I don't like doing that, uh, cause I like to make my own characters. So, uh, I just hit undo. And as long as that took to apply, it's going to take to undo. So there we go so you can actually so that is an option you also i believe sometimes here we go shaping you'll have uh you can apply um individual pieces of pre-made characters so say i just want the head from a character and maybe mm. the body the body of another character so you could really get started with this and never really have to go in and manually manipulate fingertips and and wrist joints and things like that. You could just sort of like point and click and drop it in there and, and slowly build characters and then manipulate those all the way back from scratch, right? Sure. Okay. Um, cool. And I'm, I'm about to go into the from scratch part of it here. Cool. Well, that's just so, good for, for those starting, right? So that you can go in, absolutely. you can play, build a character, kind of kind of see what it does for you, kind of see mm -hmm. how it works, throw in a background without having to get Yep, and most of these, most of these, you can um, just load the pre-made character without loading um, a base figure. Um, so, uh, like, I could just click this, and and it would give me the option to just load that character. But Got since it. I, but since I already have a figure in the scene, and I have her selected, it gives me the option to apply that to the existing figure mm -hmm. I have selected. But you could just open the software, double click that, and start working with her. Cool. Um, but then you can come over here, and almost everything you see over here is also over here to well, some extent. We don't see where you're moving, so when you oh, said over you, here. Well, oh, we see your you, mouse, but it moves yeah. pretty quick, yeah. I'm sorry about that, but it's over here in the bottom right. Got it. Yeah. This, little, this little panel right here. So the actor tab under your character... Um, even though there is a tab that says morphs, you don't pay that any attention. That is that is something that happens as you adjust the actor tab. So for the purposes of morphs, just remember that your actor tab is for morphs. And ignore that tab completely. Ignored. Um, We've so all made you... note. Ignore. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you can uh, – so you can – you can go down specifically to things and just change. Well, let, let me zoom in on her face. Um, so I'm rolling the mouse wheel to zoom in, but you also have these um, buttons up here. So say on the top right of the you want to ro um, I'm sorry. Yes. So the, the active uh, view, this big square in the middle, the active viewport, I'm in the top right corner of it. Um, right under where it says perspective view and to the right of that blue square um, you'll see these tools here if you can see where my mouse is you can't this one is for rotate and to use any of these tools you just click and drag so to rotate you would click and drag that rotate tool to pan you click and drag that pan tool to zoom you click and drag that zoom tool now this button underneath the zoom tool will center on whatever asset you have selected so you can see that i have the whole figure selected and if i click that boom puts her right in the center 
Mm. So if you were to select the frame, on, on a foot or her face. I just selected her head and clicked it again. Oh, nice. Okay. And that's an eyeball. So it's a quick way of zeroing in on things that you want to uh, want to uh, want to look at. And this right here, if you have a uh, camera, okay, it will do something if you don't have a camera. But it will reset your viewport to whatever the default is for that viewport. But I want to say just look at her head, and you can manipulate. Just say. So what's that uh, list you're in on the lower right? What is that? I am looking right now. So I'm in that actor tab. Um, and I am looking now. This is an important thing. I, I, uh, I just selected, I clicked her head. So now only options for her head are being shown. But I'll go back to clicking that whole figure. So you can see head. And then under head, you can manipulate ears, face, um, pretty much wow. everything, hair if she's got it. But like I can just click ears and then manipulate just her ears. <laughs> I can, you know, all kind of weird stuff. Look at that. Um, you know, but anything from something small and specific to full body. So I could um, – Come on, Daz, wake up. There we go. So I'm clicking this people tab here, and I can just manipulate her whole head to give her character head or um, I'm trying to find the full body. So when you select I like, guess her head, then the right-hand column, are those just attributes for that particular piece that you've selected for, like the ears or the correct for no, the okay for for whatever node for whatever just node that you have selected so like deeper and deeper you can yeah. but see i can just by slider just make her into this really weird looking figure here but um the great thing about using this panel the actor tab as opposed to the one click option is you can mix and match so say i want a little bit of this figure and then a little bit of this figure you can do oh, that oh wow or i want this figure but i want to give her crazy ears so you're going to select the head and then choose the ears and then you have options there in there you go. for that so you can mix and match all of this stuff wow. um so you can play with all of that until you have a character you like. Um, there are also – here's full body. There are also like really basic things. So like I say I want her um, – I want her to be you know, heavy set. You can do that. Um, and you can apply these. So say I loaded one of those characters, but I wanted her to be a little heavier. I could do mm -hmm. that. I could, I could um, make her into that. And then come over here to full body, and uh, oh, here we go. We can make her a bodybuilder. You know, and so and you know, you can mix and match all of those to really create a character that is to your liking. Wow, I, it would. Uh, I, I can see so, where this it would be. It's. I can see where this would be fun to experiment. But I think like just like creating a photograph, it would really help to kind of go in with some semblance of a direction that you might want that subject to be. I mean, would you would you agree with that? Because otherwise you could just click and scroll for days and maybe never actually find anything. Oh, most definitely. Um, most of most of the characters that I create, um, I've created in my head weeks prior to actually putting her putting her together in the software so i kind of know what i want but i have created characters where i've gone oh well let's just experiment with this let's do this and see how this looks and i've ended up with a person <laughs> um, you can really you can really come at it any way you want to um so so yes having a plan generally works best for me but if you're a fly by the seat of your pants kind of person and you just want to play with sliders and see what happens you can do that you can come mm -hmm. at it any way you want to
Yeah, it's very much like for us as um, photographers, right? Whether we, we apply presets or we go in and we start moving sliders for contrast, exposure, dehaze, clarity, whatever. Absolutely. Cool. So that's that's a, a little bit on uh, morphing character creation. So uh, how about uh, my power just flickered? Oh. <laughs> how about we uh, – yeah. Uh, that made me nervous. Um, so how about we actually work on a scene? So I'm going to go ahead and no, I yeah, don't want I'd to love say to that. see I'm how you to... bend her arms and her, cause I've, I've watched you do it on, on twip on the feed where you're, you're like, you've got a hand and you're like moving fingers and you're making it right. Perfect. Which. So we are going to work with Haley. We are going to work with Haley here. She's a character that I've created uh, about, I'd say, maybe two or three years ago. Oh my gosh! I don't. I don't know if I should. If I should jump into this, this this would be like a, an addiction. <laughs> There's so many things I want to render it now. It definitely is. Can you? It can definitely you, is. Can you wrap a photograph? around an object to give it that to give it i mean like could yes. you okay all right so i could take a car or a building or take grass very nice yep and you're getting into texturing oh, and okay uh i don't think we're gonna have time to go into that um that would be your uh your surfaces tab here and and you could edit surfaces no i can um, see where, where I, this this subject has has many 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 parts to it so but there have been there have been times where um i have uh put a big old um what's called a plane primitive it's just a basic flat shape in the uh -huh. back mapped a photo that i've taken to it and that's my background for my render oh wow and also um all of those textures um that you were talking about from skin materials to eyes um all of that those are jpegs um oh. all of all of those are um all of those are image files that are wrapped around the model oh wow that's crazy Yeah, so um, just just a heads up, um, Daz and Zoom don't like each other, so that's why that's why we're getting a little lag here. Yeah. Uh, so they. Uh, uh, sorry. Oh no no no! Go ahead. Um, I had a, I had a question. What, I know that you know you've done some renderings before, and we've talked. Like your machine is busy. What is your average render time for some of the images that you've shared on Twip, which are which are fairly complex, right? With backgrounds and characters and face and color and you know custom poses and things. Um, a very very simple render. Um, I've had some like if it's something like a very very simple figure, I'm rendering in black and white with a black background. Um, I've had that take an hour. Um, I've also had renders go for three days or more. Um, it just depends on how complicated the materials three the days? are. Three days? Yeah, or more. Um, I've had uh, renders go for three days, and I've stopped them at 70% <sighs> and say, okay, this is good enough. Um, the average render time for me, I'd say, is 8 to 12 hours. Wow. Yeah. So and you can't use a computer during that render time, I assume. I mean, your CPU is probably pegged. Not well. Um, I'll show you, um, God, when I talk about rendering, I'll, I'll show you how to mitigate some of that um, to make your computer somewhat usable. Right. But like, but like, I could never edit photos and render at the same time. Oh, okay. Um, I could. I'm a little nervous about demonstrating rendering and using Zoom at the same time. Yeah, but, we don't need to do that. But oh, we're gonna. Oh, we'll see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> but but this is uh, this is Haley here. Um, just a young character I've created here. Um, and so uh. 
remember earlier we bought that little outfit right there at the beginning so that outfit was for genesis 3 figures Haley here as you can see i've made note of is a genesis 8 base figure so with her being selected only content that's relevant to Genesis 3 should show. Now, because I installed it with DAS open, it might not immediately show up. That's okay. We just right click, hit refresh, and we come over here to wardrobe. Now, smart content is pretty good about breaking down the type of item it is. Now, what is that item? that I just bought listed at? Is it an outfit or each individual piece? I have no idea. So I need a way to find it, don't I? Mm -hmm. Well, we have this nifty little search bar up here. And I know that that is called garden outfit for Genesis 3 female. And look at that, there she is. Now you can look at these individual items or you can actually look at the product itself and it will show you everything that came with that product you bought. So I am going to load this um, onto her, make sure she's selected. And with smart content, it's super easy. You just, boom, there it is. Now, um, this is a habit. If you've watched me stream before, um, you know that um, I want to remove the basic wear that she was wearing in order to just, because you can see it kind of poking through, it looks weird. So I'm going to briefly stop sharing my screen while <laughs> I do that because sometimes, uh, you know, clothing's not well made and things poke through. So I'm going to briefly hide my... Uh, screen share, remove that basic wear, give her a quick once over, make sure nothing we don't want to see is popping out. Right. So I just put a question in the chat, but I'll, I can say it verbally. So I'm wondering if sure. there's anybody that's already doing any 3D rendering. I'm just, I'm curious if, if anybody's, you know, how many people aren't just like brand new at it, but have been doing it for mm. a little while. So, um, I've loaded an entire outfit at once. However, if you want, you can load pieces of the outfit. Say I just want to load the shirt or just the boots from this outfit, and maybe maybe I want to go and load shorts or pants from another outfit. You can mix and match. Mm -hmm. um, for the purposes of this, I've just loaded the entire outfit, and you can see with her being selected, everything's fit to her and parented which is a, a way of saying it's a ta is when you attach one model to another. It's called parenting. So that means when I move her, the outfit moves with her. Oh, wow. Which um, leads me perfectly into posing, which is what you wanted to talk about. So the very very the most basic part of posing is positioning um now in 3d space just like outer space there's no such thing as up down uh so we need a way to orient ourselves and for that we have this handy grid right here um if you can see these squares this mm -hmm. uh that looks on the uh, on the ground. That is our ground, and so that, uh, much like uh, any graph, you have axes. So you have the x-axis, which, for relative to this figure, would be left and right. You have the z-axis, which, relative to this figure, would be forward and back. And then you have the Y axis, which would be up and down. And we can manipulate any node in the scene along those axes in two basic ways, translate or translation rather and rotation. 
Now, going back to this, um, this bottom right panel we were looking at earlier, I'm going to come up and make sure just the figure, the base figure itself is selected. And I get all these options. But the very first ones that we pay attention to are translate and rotate. So translate is when you move a figure along an axis. So if I want to move her along that X axis, I would use X translate. Oh, cool. All right. So you would use that if you had an environment that you wanted to place her in like thirds or wherever the quadrant is in that space. That's why you would do that. Okay. Correct. And to help with that, you even have a thirds guide oh. somewhere in here. There it is. Oh, there you go. Um, and then, or translate her along Z. And if we want to get really weird, we can translate her along the Y axis. Oh, there she goes. She's leaving us. <laughs> um, then you have rotate. So a good way to figure out which way is which rotation wise is to look at this cube. If you look at the, the viewport that you're in, in the top right of any viewport, you have this little cube. And that's how you orient yourself. So blue is Z. So if I want to rotate her along the Z axis, that means she will rotate in the way that she's facing us along that blue Z axis there. Or, you know, same with X. And then the one that we would use most for a figure is Y. Oh, wow. And then this applies to any individual node. So you can click, say I click her forearm here, and you get all of that here. Now some of these, to help you, they gray some of this out, telling you, hey, you're not going to want to translate her arm because it needs to be attached to her body. <laughs> She simple things, right? Just you, simple you know, things. She wouldn't appreciate that. So only things that are most relevant that would help you out are um, highlighted. So bend. Oh, my gosh. And twist. And you could do that with every individual node. Now, there is a thing I didn't mention. You may want to use it. You may not. Is scale you can scale the image up or down as you wish. Um, don't do that, that's weird. Um, but sometimes with objects, you'll find it necessary. Like you might have a seated pose and then you bring in a chair and the chair doesn't quite fit. Well, you can just resize the chair, mm, Okay. that kind of thing. That's, that's more what you would use that for. Um, and uh, so I might, uh, Let's see here. I talked about axes. So that's, uh, that is one way you can pose by selecting individual nodes and um, using those sliders. You also have something called active pose, which is actually the tool that I have selected by default, the active pose tool. With active pose, you can just click a node and drag it. Now, that's a little weird. See, I'm trying to move her arm, but her whole body's moving. That's irritating. And now she's, you know, doing some weird yoga. Yeah, it's some weird yoga move. Yeah. <laughs> she's in quarantine, so she's very flexible now. Exactly. So I don't like that. We can come over to our um, – um, and I'm sorry. That is um, – yeah, I was right. That's uh, – I can come over to tool settings um, in this bottom right here. Um, I don't know if it's there by default or if I put it there, but um, if you don't have it, all you have to do is come up to um, window, panes, and find um, power pose and just click it and then add the tab wherever you want it. Um, so say I want to move only her arm. Mm -hmm. I can highlight, expand all, 
This is every node in the model. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So I can highlight all of those and hit toggle pins. So now, let me double check that everything has been selected. So those pins are anchor points that you can move around? No. They are pins that stop her from moving. No, okay. so, yeah, it's kind so of. So what? Oh, I, I, th I, I'm sorry. I thought you. Yeah, I meant when I said move around, oh. not move the pin around, but like your wrist or your elbow is a, is is an anchor is a pin. You move your you move your arm around. I guess that I mean it's the wrong terminology, but. Well, you would so in that example, you would put the pin in her forearm, not her wrist, because oh, you okay. because you want to move her wrist, and if you put a pin in it, it won't move. So right now. There's a pin in everything. So Got if I it. click and drag her, boom, she's not going to move at all. So I'm going to come back. Oh, I'm moving. I know I'm clicking a little fast. Collapse all. And then click the area that I want to manipulate. So click her upper arm here. Actually, let me start with her shoulder. And then you can come back over here and just go expand from selected. And all the nodes that are from that point down will expand. And then I can select all of those, toggle pin again, and you can see all the pins got released. So now I can move her arm around and nothing else is gonna move. Oh, oh, wow. Okay, so that's kind of like locking her in place. Got it. Exactly. It's locking in the joints that you don't want to move. I'm just, I'm just beginning to see the complexity of each model and movement as it pertains to the rest of the model and the mm -hmm. other movements. So as you're moving this arm, you don't want it to move the rest of the body or a head tilt or a leg movement. You want to lock down the other parts because you only want it to move one specific thing or one specific way. Correct. And then to release all the pins, you can just click unpin all. Got it. So that's active pose is just click and drag. Then we have power pose. So I click that and you see a little diagram here. And you can, I mean, you can go into the head, you can manipulate the hands individually. So this is what one way I might say, um, say I wanted to do those hand poses like you were talking about. I might select her hand, click that uh, center on her hand button so we can see that. And here I can bend. Oh, thank God I t could tell my left from right the first time. Sometimes I don't. So you can click and drag these points a certain way, and it will manipulate the joint a certain way. And you can see below the diagram of the hands exactly how that works. So if I left click and click this joint and I drag from right to left, I'm not dragging perfectly right to left, but there you go. It'll twist her hand up and down, oh gosh, we'll, yeah. up and down, we'll bend it. And then if I right click, let me reset that, right click and drag from side to side, it'll just move that hand from side to side. And everything is like that. So say I just want to, I just want to curl, curl her pointer finger. I would drag that po that right there. Or if I want to just manipulate the individual joints, I can do that. And that applies to, to everything. So let me reselect the figure, center on her. So is this how you start with your posing with your models? Do you go in and manually move each joint to get your model where you want them to be? Or do you have kind of like default poses that you start from? Um, Often, yes. Usually that is what I do. There are um, pose pieces that you can um, that you can buy. So it's like uh, click, move her uh, and, and I'll when I when I get to uh, one click poses, I'll show a little bit of that um, that you can say, okay, 
well, I've got our pose here, but God, I can't figure out what to do with this arm. I can look up my library of pre-made poses and mm. find poses that are just for the right arm. Got it. Got it. Um, so let's see. We talked about – so that's power pose. And, yeah, and you can see, like, I can take um, – I can take that and, um, you know, twists, um, all that. So it, it works everywhere. Um, so we did power pose, active pose. So when you're, when you're working with your models and, and Frederick asked this question, I had to actually look it up because I wasn't too, mm -hmm. totally familiar with it, but he's talking about hitting the barrier of the, um, uncanny Valley, you know, or basically it's the aesthetic of, uh, a, an artificial human-like appearance. At some point, it, it, it becomes di you know hard to uh, uh, doesn't become a, as appealing, right? And then at some point, you yeah. have to make it either way more realistic. So where do you where do you fall when you're creating your subjects? Are you looking for? I know you create a lot of fantasy, so I'm kind of act. I'm kind of loading the question a little bit. Sure. Like where do you where do you fall? More realistic or more fantasy style? Um, I go. Um, Yes and yes. <laughs> um, so like, um, you know, what, what Troy's alluding to is I, I have a lot of non-human characters, a lot of, um, lot of aliens, a lot of uh, vampires and, and whatnot. Um, when, I, when I create or render characters like that, um, I try to make it as close to if they were real as it could be. Um, so if you, so like, I, I'd like it to think like if I met a vampire in real life, that's, you know, this character is what that would look like. Um, got it. The, got it. The, the trick, um, in, in my mind of making them look realistic is, um, you know, this, these types of software can, can make things look so real. It's crazy, but that's where we lose people because when people look at say a still image they don't say to themselves i'm looking at a person they say to themselves they don't realize it it's subconscious but they say to themselves i am looking at an image of a person right and and we you know as photographers we know that as amazing as characters are or i'm sorry as cameras are they cannot reproduce what your what your eye sees in real life. This software can, or at least come very close. So when you see something that's uber realistic, that uncanny valley starts to creep in. So rather than try to make it look like a real person, I try to make it look like what a camera would capture. Got it. Okay. Yeah. A creative interpretation of anything else, right? Yeah. Right. Um, don't don't I don't uh, fuss so much over. Does this really look real? Um, the eye will believe what I mean. People, you know, people will believe what you tell them. I get um, requests on my art Instagram all the time for models to um, model fashion jewelry, and I for always your models to model the correct. And I always message them back. That'd be quite a trick. If you can figure out how to make it work, I'm, I'm happy to work with you. Hmm. But um, yeah, people, um, people believe what they see. Right. Um, so let's see here. Is there anything else about posing I need to go into? Oh, pre-made poses. That's an important thing. Um, so, you know, right from the get go, you don't have any experience at this. You may not necessarily be making your own poses uh, right away. Good news, you can get pre made poses. Um, so, as with anything um, that you get from the official DAS website, it will appear in, sm in smart content relative to the figure you have selected. So if I just click poses, everything I have relative to Genesis 3 will show up. So I just want this. Let's, let's click that right there and see how it looks. 
Now, an important thing, see, it's got a nice little pose right there. Now, it's important to, and this actually, this pose here actually makes the point I was about to make. Um, poses are often designed for a specific figure, usually the base figure. Um, so most of these will be for the base Genesis 8 figure. Now, sometimes really, really good developers will customize their poses for specific characters, like this one, for example. You'll see the same pose for the default Genesis 3, but then you also see Girl 7, Victoria 7. Um, the, you know, characters are different shapes and sizes. And this, uh, this character is a 12-year-old girl. The pose that I've selected for her is for is called Amazon Queen. So it's for a very large, tall, muscular character. Mm. And so you see how she the, her arms kind of bow out a little unnaturally. So oftentimes it doesn't mean necessarily that you can't use the pose. It just means that it will require some adjustment. So maybe I'll come here. I'll take that, um, select that upper arm there, come in here and hit bend, maybe move her arms in a little bit, make it look a little more natural. Oh, very nice. So those were, those were basically built for a particular um, blueprint of a model that you could apply to anything, but it's just good to know that, okay, that was meant for something of, of this, these proportions. Anything that's Genesis 3 based will apply to any Genesis 3 figure. Hmm. So um, in the case of the poses that, that I've provided, those were designed for the Genesis 8 base figure. So you can, of course, use them on any Genesis 8 character. But be aware that sh you they may require some adjustment if you use a figure that's skinnier or heavier, right. taller, shorter. Um, so just for – and I've already kind of discussed clothing. But um, just for the purposes of this demonstration, I, I'm not going to – I can see it lagging a little bit as I drag. And in, in the interest of time, I'm just going to load a quick pose here. Um, but you can actually break these down by function. So I want, say I want a standing pose, sitting pose, laying down. And you can also, as I alluded to earlier, load by region. So say I just want to make sure that figure is selected. Oops. Yeah, so it would make sense to get a pose that maybe is close to the, to the end result that you want and then tweak it from there. Yes. Got it. Yeah, let's see, that you makes can, sense. So let's see, you can find poses for just the arms. And so like this one will only move her left arm. Oh, wow. So let's, well, let's, let's try that. So let's see, left arm, let's find one. And this is a good way to mix and match pre-made poses. So let's see, let's find a good one for the right arm. So I'm guessing you could, you could manually make that right arm pose and save it. Yes, using that save as pose preset okay. option. Okay, so yeah, all right. Yep. So you could use that that over and over or share that with your community or however you want to do that because you've created that pose. Yep, as I've done. Nice. Um, in, okay, so that's, that's a little weird looking. Let's see. Let's find something. Uh, let's find a good right arm pose here. Well, at her age today, she would have a cell phone, right? Yeah, I have poses for that. <laughs> I actually do have poses for that. Uh, so let's see here. That's which one is her right arm. There we go. So Mark Charette is asking, do you have the ability to include a models, to include two models together in the same set, or would that be done post-creation. So could you add another model to this one and, and show them posed together? You can add as many models as your computer has memory for. Oh, wow. So yeah, I'll just go ahead and piece, uh, rather than, I was going to piece a little pose together, but let's, yeah, that's fine. let's yeah, find a, let's find a good, 
simple little standing pose here. Oh, uh, let's. See. I have acquired a lot of stuff. I was gonna. Over time. I was gonna say. How do, you, <laughs> how do you even choose? And and I almost never use these. I I usually pose the model myself. So I'm like picking through like. Oh, I have that. I didn't know I had that. Oh, come on, Daz. Give me a simple pose. Here we go. Now, can you choose a pose like that, like that, like a full body pose, and then just go in and say, you know what, I want to, I want to ignore everything in this pose except for, you know, everything above the waist. Um. Or would you have to go in there and just manually reset all those points? <sighs> Um, that would be the easiest way to do it. And it's not okay. that hard. It's like, so I'm not going to do it, but you would just, so remember how I was showing about expand from yeah, selected yeah. versus expand all. So you would say, say you just wanted her, um, now this particular pose that I saw, well, it went away this cause I deselected her, but this particular pose had upper and lower body, but say, say it didn't, you could just say, pick her hip right here go expand from selected select everything below her hip edit a uh, figure zero zero selected items pose and it would just reset the items that you've selected um, oh, okay. if you want if you wanted to zero out the entire figure you would zero zero figure pose zero figure will reset morphs as well as pose and we would be left with the base default genesis 3 figure oh okay I, I was only i was asking more as just sort of the flexibility of the tools that you have at your disposal and how you would apply them so it seems very now you can also manipulate your lighting and your subject and stuff right yep we are we are uh move it's, in that direction it's here. almost as if i'm reading your notes <laughs> it's it's almost almost like you are yes <laughs> we have uh, a, we do have a question though um okay for to you being both photographer and a 3d artist have you created any images where you mix your 3d character and real world characters real world people um yes once for um uh if you if you're in the twip community um you may be familiar. Um, Twip does um, a uh, critique uh, every week that's um, hosted by Troy and um, uh, the one and only Frederick Van Johnson. Um, and one of the one of the themes was uh, negative space, and I actually um, uh, posted an image where one half of it was my actual hand, and the other half of it was a character that. was a character rendered hand. Um, like reaching for each other. Um, I do remember that. That was very cool. Um, but um, real quick, I want to get into uh, environments here. So now you have several ways to load an environment. You can load, um, uh, and again, it depends on how the developer um, categorized it. You, we've got all kind of buildings, indoor, outdoor, um kind of things um so these are physical objects um that are loaded into the scene and i think we'll oh, wow. use Lamps i think we'll, everything everything you can environments pieces of an environment um this one looks pretty good um and so now i'm gonna pull back and in fact let me select so now you can see this object has loaded as a group. Each group has the individual items, so I could move these objects around individually if I chose to do so. And I'll just pull back and let you look at it. And it's loaded this nice little backyard here. Oh, wow. Um, now there is something called, let me hide that briefly. Um, there is something called an HDRI. Um, which um, Mark, Mark Charette in the chat here may be familiar with. Um, so surrounding this environment here is an invisible sphere. Much like the holodeck in Star Trek, you can project things onto this sphere. 
In fact, something is projected onto it by default, just really, really basic default lighting. Um, but you can also, you can load skies, um, you can load full environments where the dome will be warped to appear as if there's a ground, even though there's not. Oh, man. So, um, and I meant to mention this earlier, but there are different ways of looking at the figure. So um, this is texture shaded view. That's the view I work mostly in. Um, but iRay view here will show you what it looks like rendered. Um, let's see if I can do that without crashing anything. Um, <laughs> I was going to say, I bet that's that's going to take a lot because... Um, but I just want to show you, this is the default dome lighting. Oh, okay. So it's showing us the light source that, that we're working with. Okay. Um, not yet. It's trying to render, uh, trying to, uh, so iRay view essentially renders it in the viewfinder. But yeah, we're, uh, uh, let's see what's important. So that's what she's going to look like rendered. And you can see default sky lighting from the right from her um left her left right, yeah. her left camera right um but to see what's on the dome you can uh and i'm not gonna have time to talk about all this like i wanted to but um you can click draw dome and you can actually see this is what the dome looks like by default um so I'm gonna do that. So we've we've got her here. So let's say we want her we want her flush with the floorboards here. So I'm gonna wide translate her. Normally I would have several cameras pointed around in different locations. So I would have a camera looking at her. So I wouldn't be doing all this moving around right. in pers in perspective view. Um, so yeah, that looks about right. Um, uh, and I'm, I want, now I don't want this just to be this default, um, aspect ratio here. So most cameras, I think by default shoot two by three, right? So, um, mm -hmm. I come up to my general tab here. Um, and you can go to dimension presets and you have all kind of default, um, presets, uh, 4k, landscapes all the all of these wonderful things and then plus uh these are the custom ones that i've made um so i say i want this to be two two by three portrait oriented now um if you were to do a portrait of this young lady you'd probably need a camera right much like uh daz is pretty much the same way now you can render uh, based on your viewport. However, you will not get depth of field. Um, you will, everything will be in focus, which looks weird going into that uncanny valley thing. You mm -hmm. also won't have the effects that focal length would have on a portrait. Um, and so I'll just sh uh, load a uh, camera here. One thing that you can do when you load a camera, so say I want her, I want this to be the way we see her. You have the ability to load a camera and copy your active view. So now I can move and I can see, look at, look at that, there's a camera there. Oh, nice. Oh, very cool. And then I can come down. These are my views, and you and we can see the cameras there. So now I can, if I want to mess with her some more, I can, uh, I could go into this perspective view, do do things in the scene, mess with her, mess with posing, but not lose my view. And camera settings here. Now we're going to see a lot of stuff that starts looking familiar as photographers things like frame width now by default the dimensions are that of full frame which should be a 35 millimeter film cell so it'd be um 36 by 65 millimeters we can change that so 
Frederick's here, so he probably wants micro four thirds. Uh, so whatever, <laughs> whatever, whatever size micro four thirds is, you can mess with that and get it, uh, get that the way you want it. Um, look at that F stop. That looks familiar, doesn't it? Um, so we turn on depth of field here and I don't know if y'all saw it up here, but these two little planes appeared. Now you can see this pyramid thing projecting from the camera. Everything inside of that is what's in view. And what's in between these two planes here is what's in focus. Oh, nice. So by default, it's set at F22. And you can see as I move, um, as I move the focal plane, you can see that. And you can see the little, that's the center of it. Um, so I can widen my aperture, lower that f-stop, and you can actually see depth of field get shallower in real time. Wow. Um, and there's a lot of work that you have to do because obviously depth of field would not normally be that shallow at f22. Now, one thing um, that's different from actual photography is depth of field for camera setting purposes or uh, f-stop for camera setting purposes only affects depth of field. It does not affect exposure. But um, you can get into all kind of nitty gritty, like changing, um, you know, things like your distortion, aperture, number of aperture blades, all that wonderful stuff. Holy now, God. now I have a set of, of camera presets that actually mimic DSLR lenses. So I would probably shoot her with, say, an 85 millimeter F1.2. I'm going to come to that view, put her, put her in the in the frame there so do you build your character first and then figure out your camera position and settings later the character almost always comes first got it okay not always but usually um so i'm gonna narrow that all the way to f12 move that to where her eye is make sure that's on her eye change the focal plane there and we'll say that's a little shallow so we'll make it f28 and you can see that's the cool part seeing the depth of field change in real time right. so let's see how that looks i'm trying to pick up speed a little bit because i know it's uh you're good you're good we have a couple questions we've been on f uh, sure uh mark charette he, he put a question in here, and he put a big word in because he knows I'm not good with big words. But he says, can you render out an equa rectangular view? I don't know what that is. Um, I wonder if that's Neither that do I. horizontal 360 degree. Um, does this have the ability to output a 360 degree render? Um, I don't think so, no. Okay. Um, I believe it will only render two-dimensional images, but you can um, map a three-dimensional image to a dome or a sphere in the scene. So now we see our model here, f two, you know, eighty-five millimeters at f two eight. That's pretty wide, so we got a nice shallow depth of field here. Focus right on her eye where it should be. Uh, now we're still using default lighting, so lighting looks kind of bad, but. We're going to do something about that, but you can see in real time. So say, I, I, oh, that's too shallow. I want to make it F8. Boom. Look at that. You see more of, you see the depth of field increase in real time without affecting exposure. But I like that. I like it at F28. Wow. So much control. Now... In this particular scene, look at that. We've got nothing back there. We we can see the empty dome. We don't want that. Um, so I'm going to keep it in eye ray view as long as – but if I start stuttering or lagging or anything, let me know, and I'll, I'll throw it back to texture shaded. Now, I have got some good um, HDRIs, which is what I mentioned, those uh, pro things to project on the dome that I mentioned earlier. So I'm going to I'm going to zoom out and show you what it looks like when I actually apply it to the dome. So here is our scene. 
zoomed out. Not much of anything. Uh, I'm going to come here to my content library. And let's see, I know I have got some skies in here. Skies of irradiance. Here we go. Uh, let's make it a nice sunny daylight here. Let's do this one. Now, by default, um, some of these will load a, uh, um, will change settings. So you notice how we, we didn't have that draw dome on before, and we do now. Right. Once you applied that sky, it knew it needed to turn that on to see it. Exactly. Okay. Now, that's a little high. Uh, let's see if we can find a lower one. Well, let's see what that looks like. Uh, that's not so bad, actually. Kind of like the way those lights coming through that, the slats in the top there. But um, let's see if we can find something better. Now, just for giggles, let's hide this. And it goes... Okay, when I click that eyeball, it's supposed to go away. <laughs> Let's just delete it. So now we've got nothing but her. I'm going to switch that default here. Go to perspective view, and I'm surprised it's working this well. Of course, now that I've shot myself in the foot. <laughs> yeah. Um, so there is an important thing. Uh, let me go to the camera setting and turn off depth of field so now we'll see everything you can render you can project entire images entire scenes onto the dome exactly the same way that we projected that sky oh now that puts her in an environment oh, wow. it does now that looks weird because she's not flush because I remember I lifted her up off the ground right to make right. her to make her level um, to fix that we um, control D or uh, it may be command D on Mac I'm not sure yeah we'll move any model to the ground that looks a little better but we've got an issue though so I come back here to my actual camera and turn on depth. Watch what happens when I turn on depth of field. Now that looks okay because we can't see her feet. But say we were rendering her full body. Whoops. Because that ground is not actually underneath her. It's out on the dome. Now, the dome can be warped to make it appear as if uh, there is depth of field uh, and, and obey so like it goes out of focus. Right. Um, okay. Um, and I, I don't know that I have time to get into showing you all how to do that. But, yeah, probably not. We're, but, we're coming out of the last 10 minutes. Yeah, but some, some will do it um, by default. But we're just, I'm just going to go back and um, reload that environment in that sky. So are you able to control multiple light sources as well? So if you wanted to do hatchet lighting or you wanted to put like a, an edge light over her shoulder or a backlight with a shadow, I mean, once you've kind of got your environment figured out, can you add lights to do that? Just like what we might do in the real world is like, oh, this sure. natural light's nice, but I, I want to kick her over here to put some light in the side of her face. Definitely. And um, you can even um, um, control to what extent the dome in the scene um, inter uh, interact with scene light. So I could say, like right here where you see environment ro mode uh, near the top right, um, I can say I only want the dome. 
or I only want scene lights. But right now I have it set so that both oh, okay. are, are shown. So going back to that, um, I'm not even going to worry about the sky. Um, I'm just going to leave that blank and default because we're not actually going to render this. Um, so let's see. Let's see if we can uh, ID a lighting challenge here. And just while uh, Josh was dialing some of that stuff in, we're coming down to sort of our last 10 minutes or so. So if you guys have any questions, now's a really good time to get those into the Q&A panel so we can make sure we try to address as many of those as possible before we wrap up. Uh, I mean, obviously, this is an enormous amount of content. So yeah, for and, to I'm not, uh, and I'm not uh, not going to go too much into um um, light um, specific the manipulating lights and, um, and and things like that we just don't have time for it and I'm not gonna fuss too much with render settings I guess we can do that another time because that's that's a whole lot but you know like to answer your question so in this if this were your lighting right here you might say oh gosh you know I might need some fill on her face or, mm -hmm. or um or, or something like that, you can, and I'm gonna go back into texture shaded view for that purpose. Um, I'm not gonna worry about getting it perfect. Um, come back into, um, yeah, her feet are still sunk into the floor. Yeah, cause you um, reset her, yeah. Yeah, uh, that's all right. Nobody knows but her. Um, I'm gonna be, I'm not gonna be, uh, fuss with making it perfect. Um, your lights are up here. Um, you have distant light, which is meant to mimic, like, say, the sun. You have, like, a distant sunlight coming at her from far away, that kind of thing. Then you have um, point light and linear point light, which do almost exactly the same thing. Um, think of point lights like a candle or a Christmas tree light. Right. It's just a point of light. And then what I'm going to load here is a spotlight, which is like a spotlight. Um, and li much like when I loaded the camera, I have the option to load it in a default position, or I can load it in whatever um, um, position I want or what, whatever position I have the viewport. And you can see a thing happened here. Uh, and you also notice the lighting changed a little bit in our preview, didn't it? Yeah. Now, now what it's attempting to do is give you an idea of where the how that light's going to hit her. It's not going to perfectly show it, and sometimes that gets annoying. You can turn that off in by uh, Control or Command L to disable or enable um, light simulation. Now. So, and you also, like a camera, have the ability to view things from the perspective of the light. So, oh, nice. So, we're going to make sure that has clear line of sight, and it does. So, by default, these lights are not very bright. So, when I throw it back into eye ray view, you're not going to see much has changed. So I'm going to come over here. I'm going to select my light over here on the left and then select light down here in this bottom right tab and all the light settings will come up. And I can change the color, um, the ang spread angle. You can change everything about the light. Now, this is a very, by default, it's a very narrow spotlight, not very bright. So one of the first things I may want to change is the brightness. You can come down, uh, oh, my zoom is in the way. Uh, you can come down here and you see the lumens of that, the lumens and color temperature of the light. By default, it's daylight balance for 6,500. And 1,500 is not that much. I'm gonna change it to 150,000. Hmm. And we'll see a difference there. Right. Now, that looks kind of harsh. I don't like that. So to change that, maybe I want to make it more softboxy. You can change your light geometry from point 
to rectangle, which would be like a like a regular rectangle softbox, oh, or yeah. or disk, which would be like say an octabox. So I'm gonna say rectangle, and then I'm gonna change the diameter, and you see these units here. Now to give you perspective, if you remember that grid we were looking at earlier, each square is one square meter by default. So say I wanted a one and um, uh, one meter is 100 of these units. So each one of those square each so from uh, line to line on the axis is 100 units. So to make a one square meter softbox say I would go 100 by 100. Look how the light gets softer. Wow. The shadows are less harsh looks a little bit better. Maybe I even want to kick up the intensity a little bit. Let's say 200,000. And it looks kind of weird. Let's make it a little warmer. So say this is for, a good exercise also for from a photographer's point of view is playing with light, you know, and, and moving things around and seeing how shadows interact. And mm. that's really cool. Yeah. And um, you can change now. I'm not. Uh, I'm not going to go in, into this as much as I wanted to because we're we're pushing it. But right. Um, tone mapping would be how you adjust your exposure in real time. So you'll see very familiar things here. ISO, f-stop. Now we saw f-stop earlier, didn't we? And the camera thing. This f-stop controls exposure. So if I were to say make it from f8 to f28 like the camera is, look how bright that gets. So just like in real life, we would change our shutter speed to compensate. Let's sure. say, let's say 1 640th. Um, and you, then, you know, you control, you can even white balance. So I could actually load a, a card here, uh, a little prim plain primitive, make it 18% gray, sample that, and then change the white point if I wanted to white balance in camera so you can you have some contrast controls um so say i want to um clip my shadows a little bit i could i could get real crazy let's make it oh that it only goes up to one but see how dark those shadows get yeah um and it's the opposite with highlights i could clip those highlights and so you can manipulate um contrast and then iso works just like iso on your camera um, I can I can even create a vignette here. Um, I can control, say I want to render it in black and white. I can make that saturation zero. Um, you know, and I want to I want to be like say filmy high contrast. Let's jack that ISO up to three hundred, and then just crush this gamma here. And I can make it look kind of. Uh, well, I would need to play with the highlights a little more, but you know, we can make it look filmy and old school. Right, because those are all things that you would do towards the end once you've got your scene set, you've got your camera angle set, this is the shot I'm going to take, and now I'm going to stylize it with our photographic skill set, which is the exposure. Um, sure. We do have a couple questions that we're going to get through before we wrap up. Uh, sure. Unless you had something else that you were going to show. Um, can... I was just double checking my notes, making sure there's nothing super, super important. Um, uh, this, uh, just before you get ready to render, you have the option to render directly to a file, in which case you won't see the render progress. I don't like that. Um, you can pick right here is where you would pick where to save the render by default. You can also do that after it's done rendering. This is also where you would name the file. Um, and we already talked about these pre uh, dimensions and the things like mm -hmm. that. Um, the very last thing, the only thing I really want to talk about for render settings is the quality settings. Um, by default, these settings are very low. Um, for test rendering. Um, to get a decent render, um, I would up this, um, now this converge ratio is when the renderer considers a pixel to be rendered. And rather than 95, I would make it 99. Um, you can never make it 100. I don't know why, but if you make it 100, it'll crash. Um, up my rendering quality to say three. And that, and that has nothing to do with your machine. 
that is universally across the board. Uh, it can never have a pixel 100% rendered, and that's so you can you can tell it to stop rendering after a certain time. Well, that's not a lot of time, so I'm going to jack that up to the maximum. I'm going to make that up pretty high, 150,000. So that is a decent render right there. 99% three time up all the way and pull up the number of samples all the way and that's that's what i would um that's what i would render off of perfect perfect awesome all right let's go ahead and jump into the questions oh there you go i was gonna say we can cancel the, we can squeeze here thank you for demoing all that that is a, a a deep breath um and it's a lot of information good thing that we have it recorded so we can go back and watch that over again. So let's right. jump into our question. So we've got Kim Shapiro, uh, who is a good friend of ours and she's a CSI photographer in San Bernardino and she deals with some 3D stuff. And her question is, um, I use the Pharaoh Zone 3D at work. It's similar. I always have trouble getting my figures, characters, cars, etc., on the same plane as the ground, uh, like your floating lady model that you had there. Any suggestions or tips on how to ground them easily? Um, in Daz has a very simple command for that. Um, in Windows, it's Control D. It may be different in Mac. It may be Command D, um, but um, Command D or Control D will bring anything that you've had that you have selected straight to the ground plane. So there might be a shortcut or something that that Kim can look for in there, just kind of bring everything right to the to the ground plane quickly. Um, yes, but I'm I'm not familiar with that right. software though, unfortunately. And then Frederick's got a couple questions in here, and and he usually has good questions. That's kind of what Frederick does, right? Um, if, so if if you had to choose, would you choose to shoot with your camera, or or create with the computer? So if you had to, one or the other. Um, I find that as my skills improve in one, my skills in the other also improve. There, there are very many similarities between the two. That's rough because I really – Just depends if, it, if you've had enough of humans that day and, and you want to be on the computer. Well, there's a reason I don't take pictures of people. <laughs> um, but, uh, God, I don't know that I could honestly pick because – if I were coming, if I had never done either, and I were coming straight into it, it would be photography all the way. Um, photography for me is a lot of fun, um, and it's uh, it is this software that led me to photography. So I don't know that if I weren't doing this, I would have ever picked up a camera. Um, but you know, these characters are kind of like my kids, man. Like they're all like real people in my head. Like I yeah. don't know that I could give them up, you know, <laughs> they all have lives and stories. They're all running around up here. I can see, I can see. So I, I don't, I don't think I could choose. So one, one last question is, is maybe even a bigger question than uh, we could, you know, you could answer in just one, one short snippet is, you know, is there is there a career in this? Is there money to be made in being able to render 3D models? Or, you know, where where does that go? How do you make money knowing how to do this? I know this is your hobby. We've, we've had that conversation in the past. Mm -hmm. Like you do this because you love to do it. But is there is there another is there another aspect to that? Most definitely. Um, what we're looking at is um, part of the basics for things like a video game character making. In fact, you can use this software to make characters for video games or um, CGI characters for animated movies or, or even, you know, live action now has CGI characters as well. Um, all of this stuff has its foundation in what we're doing here. So this could, this could be an on-ramp to bigger things. Like if you're gonna go, well, I'm gonna eventually go work for ILM. Is this an on-ramp to that kind of, even just conceptually? Um, um, absolutely. Um, okay. um, I have been, um, I, I have had studios interested, um, in my characters before. Um, so there is definite money in it, in that Avenue. There's also money in asset creation. I mean, uh, I mean, as you pointed out, that's how Daz makes their money and, right. and, and almost every 
but almost everybody, almost all of those products are made by independent artists that sell on the DAS market. And uh, those third party sites that I showed you, most of them, they have people selling on there. So oh um, okay. there, there is, there is definite money in um, asset creation as well. Fantastic. Well, Joshua, thank you for donating so much of your time to us here today. And thank you everybody who came to watch. If you want to follow Joshua more, I will put his links in the description on the YouTube channel. They're in the chat. If you scroll back real quick, you can find those, but don't worry, I'll put them in the, in the YouTube channel and you can go stalk him on Instagram. Um, as I said early on, uh, Joshua and I became friends and met each other. He came to F64 Live last last year. Oh, no. Yeah. And yeah. the year before that, right? The nope. last two years? Oh, just last year. Right. See, I'm... <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, that's right. It was last year. Right. And this, we met this on... This is all I got. <laughs> yeah, there you go. And we met on Twit Pro, which is thisweekinphoto.com. There's a, an amazing community there that many of us are part of. Uh, all, all photographers and creatives, and it's a great place for us to hang out. So again, thank you everybody for coming. Thank you for spending time with us. And this will be recorded as it's recorded. It will be posted in the coming weeks and we'll let everybody know where it's at. So thank you guys.